Let's pray. Speak, O Lord. Amen. Okay, who needs a Bible? Raise your hand if you need a Bible. We'll make sure to get you one. As all, yeah, that's really good. We'll make sure you get one. Well, I'd like to just say that a topical series on technology was not something that I was overly excited about doing. Um, but I hope you've been blessed by it, and it's definitely been, it's definitely been a thrill for me. Uh, I've enjoyed digging into a lot of different things outside of the Bible that I wouldn't normally uh, read, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a joy to search the scriptures for, for things that can really be tangibly applied uh, in our lives in the realm of technology. So I just wanted that it's been a joy for me. On February 23rd, 2017, at 10.04 a.m., John Dickerson tweeted the following words. My dear Wormwood, I see you've gotten our patient to join Twitter. My work is done here. Your affectionate screw tape. Of course, no one who actually reads C.S. Lewis' book, The Screw Tape Letters, will actually ever find those words in it. But the sentiment caught my attention. Amidst the social media platforms, I think Twitter is unique, largely because of the fact that it limits the characters that its users can employ in a tweet. One article commented on the platform like this. For as long as Twitter has existed, it's been a place of brevity, if not levity. The 140 character limit, originally created so that tweets could fit into a single SMS message, is as much a part of the brand as the silhouetted bird. You want to yell about the NFL, hurl some insults at the president, or debate the parentage of Kylie Jenner's unborn child? Fine, just make it quick. We live in a world where the quicker, the sharper, the punchier the message, the more palatable, the more retweetable, and the more socially transferable it becomes. Farhad Manju of the New York Times says that this is part of the choir of voices that are all sending us the same message, quote, welcome to the post-text future. How are Christians to process the possibility of a future that considers text and written modes of communication a thing of the past? What problems does this present to the church? What challenges do the people of God face along these lines? Or, rather than problems and challenges, should the church instead consider a post-text future an opportunity for growth and progress? Manju, in his article on the state of the internet, I think is really interesting and is worth quoting at length. Quote, This multimedia internet has been gaining on the text-based internet for years, but last year, the story accelerated sharply, and now audio and video are unstoppable. The most influential communicators online once worked on web pages and blogs. They're now making podcasts, Netflix shows, propaganda memes, Instagram and YouTube channels. Consider the most compelling digital innovations now emerging. The talking assistants that were hit the hit of the holidays. Apple's face reading phone artificial intelligence to search photos or translate spoken language, and augmented reality, which inserts any digital image into a live view of your surroundings. These advances are all about cameras, microphones, your voice, your ears, and your eyes. Together, they're all sending us the same message. Welcome to the post-text future. Tonight's sermon is about communication and technology. And I first want to consider the fact that God speaks. That God speaks to humanity. And he speaks to humanity through human language. And I also want to consider how technology helps and hinders our ability to communicate with God and one another. I think for Christians, or for at least for people who are considering the truth claims and the plausibility of the truth claims of the Christian faith, 
There's a few things to consider along these lines. And the first, like I said, and I think the, the most important of all, is the truth that we serve a speaking God. Number one, God is a communicator. The God of the Bible is a God that communicates with humanity. This is apparent in the Bible's very first page, where the first thing we see the creating God do is speak. This truth echoes from Genesis 1, verse 3's, and God said. It echoes from there to Psalm 19's eloquent treatment of the Lord's perfect law, his sure testimony, his right precepts, and pure commandments. It echoes from the miracle that we find throughout the whole book of Psalms, that humanity's devotional words to God become God's revelatory words to humanity. It's a miracle. It echoes from there to the thus says the lords of Ezekiel, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Nathan, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. It echoes from the 400 years of revelatory silence following the closing words of Malachi to John's prologue and his introduction of the Word, who was not only with God in the beginning, but who was God and forever is and will be the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, this very same Word of God, led Peter to ask him a question that I think has fallen on our culture's deaf ears. Where else can we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. God is the life-giving communicator. We serve a God who speaks, who relates, who reveals. He doesn't leave us guessing. He brought us into the light. And the Bible has some things to say about this miracle. Namely, that this God speaks in two ways. First, through creation, on the one hand, and second, through scripture, on the other hand. For the first, I want to turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, which you can find on page 456, if you're using the Pew Bibles at the Met. Psalm 19. That's page 456. God speaks to us, first, through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. This psalm makes the rather bold claim that one simply has to take one glimpse outside. And that one glimpse is all the world needs to get a sense, a reasonable sense, for God's glory. The shining sun testifies to God's glorious attributes. The glimmering stars point to a wise and eternal creator. The incredible detail of nature proclaims the handiwork of a divine designer. And this declaration, this speech and voice carries with it a universal message. And we can see it in there in verses 3 to 4, which tell us that all the earth hears God's word through God's world. But the thrilling fact that the message of God's glory is going forth from the heavens brings with it a sobering message of bad news. That the revelation of God's glory is actually insufficient to save. Sinful humanity is also in need of a revelation of grace. The Apostle Paul in Romans 1 wrote that humanity finds itself dependent on another kind of revelation. You don't have to turn there, but listen to what he says from verse 18. That the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. You can hear that language of revelation, even like we heard in Psalm 19. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, 
For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. God's glorious act to reveal himself in creation is only sufficient to condemn humanity and leave them without excuse. But we praise him because he gave us his word. He gave us the scriptures. God condescended to make himself known to sinful humanity through the words of sinful humanity that he might save sinful humanity. This is the miracle of divine revelation through human communication. God makes himself known to us in a way that we can understand him. God speaks, and he does so through his world, and he does so through our words. God speaks through creation, and he also speaks through scripture. For this point, I'd like to have a look at Hebrews 1 and to its opening verses. And you can find that on page 1001. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. God speaks through creation, but he also speaks through Scripture. Hebrews 1 and 1 to 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Matt Smethurst uh, is one of my favorite Uh, recent authors, and in his little book called Before You Read Your Bible, he writes some of the most helpful words that I've come across to help us understand the importance of the Bibles that we hold in our hands. And he wants us to know what our Bibles are, or what your Bible is, before you begin to consider what it says. He wants you to understand what we hold in our hands before we start to consider what it says in its pages. He wants you to understand the implications of what it means to pick one of these up. Smethurst writes this under the heading, Talkative God. If the existence of the Bible reveals anything about God, it's that he's a talker. He could have remained silent. He really could have, but he didn't. Your Bible is tangible evidence that the maker of the universe is a communicator. He's someone who initiates, who reveals, who speaks. There are, after all, only two options when it comes to knowledge of our creator. Revelation or speculation. Either he speaks or we guess. And he has spoken. Long ago, at many times, And in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son. God gave us, loved ones, his word in Scripture to testify to his word incarnate. The words of his prophets were written down that we might anticipate, know, cherish, love, and serve the true and better prophet who was to come, who came, who lived, who died, who rose, who reigns, and will come again. God speaks to us and reveals to us the extent of his love for us, not only through pages, but through a person. His love that he showed to enter our world, bear our sins, carry our sorrows. And considering the fact that, if alone, creation's revelation leaves us to speculation. We ought to be on our knees in the light of the fact that God spoke to us through this. 
Smethurst finishes his thoughts by quoting one of my personal heroes of the faith, Carl F.H. Henry, when he says the following, and I, and I love this, that God forfeited his personal privacy to befriend us. Your Bible is like an all-access pass into the revealed mind and heart of God. I would challenge you all to think about what your Bible is when you pick it up to read it. Loved ones, God is a communicator, and he speaks to us through the world and through his word. The word of the world condemns us and leaves us with no excuses. The word of his son saves us and leaves us with no condemnation. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot writing on the Bible. A lot writing on 66 ancient books. A collection of 39 written in ancient Hebrew and 27 written in ancient Greek. Text. Really, really old text. And yet, we know that this text is living and active, Hebrews chapter 4. We know that it's God-breathed and is profitable for teaching and training the man of God in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3. We know that according to it, it is the very word of God. So if, in fact, we've been placed in a world that's welcoming us into a post-text future, the question is, are we forced to embrace that future? Are we being pushed into leaving our Bibles on bookshelves that are becoming virtually obsolete? What has the evolution of our digital age done to our ability to converse with this speaking God and to converse with one another? Which brings us to our second point. Number two, technology affects how we hear and proclaim the word of God. Perhaps it's true, as sociologist Sherry Turkle puts it, that we are in desperate need of reclaiming conversation in a digital age. Because the Bible isn't only a textbook of information about God. It's an invitation for conversation with God. But could it be that modern technology has hindered our ability to enter into that intimacy? Or could we actually embrace technological innovation to improve upon our ability to converse with God and others? Now is our chance to look toward the answer to these questions. Eddie Mora was a struggling author in New York City. His girlfriend dumped him because of the ramifications of his writer's block. Eddie then ran to his ex-wife's brother, who gave Eddie a sample of a new cognitive-enhancing drug called NZT48. Taking his first dose of the drug almost immediately empowered him to make significant progress on his book and make improvements on his lifestyle, including his appearance and his social capacity. The drug allowed him to write better. It allowed him to dress better, and in some measure, to interact better with others, at least for a while. Eddie Mora is the main character of the book Limitless, and anybody who's seen the movie knows that with the Limitless drug comes incredible powers and incredible benefits, but with it also comes consequences, side effects, and death. And I think we'd be silly as Christians if we just ran to a monastic treat retreat center and became monks, just leaving all gadgets, electronics, and digital media behind. But we also have to recognize that with the benefits of technology also come unique burdens. Benefits and burdens as we try to communicate with God and one another. So tonight I just want to talk about the burdens and the benefits and a way forward for Christians when considering technology and communication, considering the fact that we serve a speaking God. First, the burdens. Sherry Turkle, in the book that I mentioned moments ago, makes innumerable observations that I think would be worth laying out in a sermon like this. 
But one that I found particularly helpful was one specific widespread social trend, one that she calls the flight from conversation to mere connection. Away from conversational intimacy to shallow connectivity. Despite the fact that we're undeniably more connected than ever before, in large measure, I think, due to technology, we also need to consider the ramifications that our connectedness has on our conversation. Have we sacrificed conversation on the altar of connection? Have we abandoned healthy solitude for the experience of real-life loneliness? Although connectivity is directly correlated to efficiency, it's shown to decrease the quality of our intimacy and vulnerability. Studies have shown that the mere presence of a phone, even if it's turned off, highly affects and changes what people talk about. If we think we might be interrupted, if we think that there might be a chance for a text or a notification, we tend to keep conversations light on topics of little controversy or little consequence. It's the strange paradox that Turkle calls being alone together. I wonder if you personally experience what she describes, and I dialed up a few pictures for us to consider. Uh, there's some kiddos experiencing some uh, nice family time. There's some students doing their homework. And uh, there's a loving couple just enjoying some intimacy together there uh, on their phones. And I think these are some pretty disturbing um, visual depictions of 21st century human relationships. I think we're disconnected in reality because of the devices that are designed to keep us connected virtually. Turkle reports that over the past 20 years, we've seen a 40% decline in the markers for empathy amongst university students. Happiness, sadness, compassion, and more. When people spend more time video chatting, checking out memes on Instagram, online DMing and texting than we do in face-to-face -face conversation, we actually begin to lose touch with what it means to communicate. A 15-year-old named Leslie describes what it's like at her home. Quote, My mom is always on her email, always on her phone. She always has it next to her at the dinner table, and if there's the slightest little buzz or anything, she'll look at it. She always has some excuse. When we're out to dinner, she'll pretend to put it away, but she'll have it on her lap. She'll be looking down, but it will be so obvious. Me and my dad and my sister will all tell her to get off her phone. But at dinner, my mom is doing her own thing on her phone, and it ends up being my dad is sitting there, I'm sitting there, my sister is sitting there. No one is talking or anything. It's a chain reaction. Only one person has to start. Only one person has to stop talking. Many of you, if not all of you, have likely experienced something like this. In fact, I was actually sent a personal testimony of someone who's sitting in this very room right now along these lines. He said, quote, An example that I've had many times in my life is when I'd be hanging out with friends at a house or even at a restaurant, and literally every single person out of a group of six is on their phones, not talking, just on social media. There's been times where the most communication that's happened was someone sharing a funny meme or something in a group chat that everyone at the table is in. <laughs> I feel like this situation has happened to others. And it's crazy how we just turn off our communication with each other and turn to our phones instead. Close quote. But I think it's fair to say that we don't always realize the effect that these situations is having, that we're actually being stunted in our ability to converse and to communicate. Turkle moves on and reports that there's an analogy between human relationship to conversation and to reading. Teachers complain that students from middle school and beyond are less able than their peers from just a decade ago to read books that require sustained attention. As we said before, God, uh, is a communicating God, 
and he's communicated to us through a text, through prophets whose words were recorded and written down so that God's heart and mind would be revealed to us. And ultimately, God communicates to us through his Son, whose own teachings and whose own words were written down so that we might come to know him and love him and communicate with him. Cognitive neuroscientist Marianne Wolfe, in her studies, has discovered a widespread shift away from what she calls deep reading. She says that, quote, today, adults who grew up reading serious literature can force themselves to focus on long texts and reactivate the neural circuits for deep reading that they may have lost after spending more time online than with books. But children need to develop these circuits in the first place. I got my first flip phone when I was halfway through high school. And if I were a betting man, I would imagine that most of you probably had smartphones by the time you got to high school. And it's possible that the deep reading required to internalize the Word of God is still a skill you need to develop. Jesus says that his sheep hear his voice and they come to him. Psalm 1 says that the person is blessed whose delight is in the instruction of the Lord and whose, on whose word he meditates day and night. Joshua 1 says the Bible shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Why? So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then he will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. But it may be that the danger of our digital age has rendered us virtually incapable of experiencing the blessing and success on offer? Could it be that cyber stimulation has hijacked our ability to experience scriptural meditation? Author Shane Hips, in his book, Flickering Pixels, articulates what the different hemispheres of our brains are designed to do. I found this really interesting. He said that, quote, with the invention of the printing press, created supreme talents in the areas of science and reason. He called it a tyranny of the left brain, where the right brain departed for distant lands. <laughs> the left brain is heavily engaged by the printed book, by in-depth monologue, and by linear argument. But the digital age has transformed the meaning of literacy through media that dominates the right brain, like blogs, videos, texting, GIFs, and image culture. And the fact of the matter is, is it GIFs? <laughs> I said GIFs. Yeah. I, okay. <laughs> Hank, Hank wants to go toe-to-toe? -to -toe. It's GIFs? Okay. GIFs, GIFs, image culture. I found this quote sobering by Hips. He says, the Bible is an extraordinary, extraordinarily demanding library of books. The stories, letters, and law are shrouded by the fog of time. The thick, dusty languages of ancient Greek and Hebrew convey the message through cumbersome translations. If the Bible is anything, it's complex. So it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't surprise us to see a growing biblical illiteracy in the electronic age. In other words, bulging left brain muscles are an essential tool for understanding the Bible. Unfortunately, our digital diet sedates the left brain, leaving it in a state of hypnotic stupor. The left brain begins acting like our great Uncle Jerry, nodding off in the recliner after Thanksgiving dinner. Large portions of the Bible are growing faint and becoming inaccessible to our lethargic left brains. It's like we need to retrain our brains for information. Anybody who's tried to cut sugar or process carbs in your diet uh, knows that it can be a challenge. Um, but over time, I think with a commitment to a balanced diet, foods that used to taste 